I um, was fortunate enough to spend 18 months, more or less, uh, working with NTIA and the U.S. Commerce Department. Um, and the project we were working on was on AI accountability policy. And so we submitted, a, a released a request for comment. Um, we received over 1,400 responses, and this was before the administration's executive order on AI came out, so we were working in parallel. The conclusions that we arrived at on the basis of the comments and also extensive stakeholder consultation fell into three categories. Um, they were recommendations for guidance, for support, and for regulations, and they were mostly directed at the federal government, although keeping in mind that these are going to be public-private um, implementations. And so um, starting with the guidance, uh, we concluded that uh, the federal government could do much more to help um, create and shape an AI accountability ecosystem uh, by creating guidance for standardized disclosures around AI systems, um, for AI audits and evaluations, uh, for AI auditors uh, and, and evaluators, um, uh, the, the independent, their independence and their capabilities. Uh, on regulations, we recommended that for high-risk AI systems, um, uh, at least for some of them, there should be mandatory uh, risk evaluations, performance evaluations, and or audits. Um, and then uh, for support, we recommended that, um, and some of this now has been incorporated into the uh, executive order and to subsequent at federal actions, we recommended um, that there be resources provided for um, uh, various inputs and infrastructures like compute, um, data, also that federal federal government's use of AI itself kind of make a market for accountable um, AI. One of the questions we asked in the uh, um, AI accountability proceeding was about um, vertical and horizontal AI regulatory capacity. And so um, vertical capacity would be uh, with the ability of Co congressional committees and agencies with jurisdiction, for example, over employment or over healthcare or pharmaceuticals, to regulate AI, and then horizontal capacity would be cross domain um, uh, capacity in the federal government, either to regulate or provide guidance or otherwise be involved with. Um, AI regulation, and we concluded that um, I mean the the the, the domain-specific expertise is there, and those agencies are running with either enforcement actions um, or considering or enacting regulations on the cross-domain uh, uh, federal AI capacity. That was something that the AI um, executive order um, took up, and and so there are we are beginning to see um, the beginnings of that uh, on the first. Further question of whether there should be an AI agency, um, we didn't deal with that in the um, in the NTIA proceeding. But it's a question that's gotten a lot of academic attention, and you know, as as my opinion as an academic is that. Um, uh, it's it's we definitely need federal um, horizontal capacity, but having a new agency is um, possibly uh, a, a bit dangerous in that um, it could lead to a lot of capture by the biggest AI companies who will be the ones who will um, probably dictate the the sort of um, jurisdiction reach capabilities um, and functions of such an agency. So. Um, but I think what's interesting is that there are steps to create horizontal capacity that are far short of an AI agency, uh, and that really is needed because no, f for two reasons. One, no um, particular federal agency has sufficient expertise um, uh, and so needs the help. And then also there needs to be coordination across the domains. Um, so for example, if you're going to have sort of uh, a requirement for non-discrimination, um, you would want that to be both in the healthcare sector and in the, in, um, the employment sector and in you know, the transportation sector, et cetera. There is a danger that certain kinds of regulation can, in and of itself, become a barrier to competition. Um, and those are, I, you know, I think the chief example of that is our pre-release licensing requirements um, that really, especially if they're onerous, that they can really only be um, 
uh, carried out by the most well-heeled, largest companies. Uh, and so, um, you know, that can be, uh, so, so sometimes um, in an effort to, well, let me start, let me stop there. Let me think what I want to say. Um, one of the ways to regulate AI uh, and not and, and actually encourage competition is to have risk-based regulation um, so that you are regulating most comprehensively the kinds of AI that pose the greatest risks. Um, there's widespread agreement on that, and that was something that the NTIA AI Accountability Policy Report um, and recommendations emphasized, that there was, that was a sort of a consensus view, and that was across civil society, industry, academia, and government. Um, so that's well enough and good, but the problem is that um, you don't always know what the risk is, what the risk profile of certainly of a, of a system that's been developed before it's been deployed. Um, and so that's why probably, you know, the most um, sensible regulatory structure uh, is a set of um, requirements that are pretty light ex ante, but then have the capability to be revisited and that feed into ex post liability systems. Um, and one of the ways we thought about this problem was thinking about an accountability pipeline. So so that you don't overburden, especially small and medium-sized enterprises from the beginning, um, that you sort of look towards deployed systems and ex post. So after um, you know maybe the, some of the risks have been realized and you have a liability system that redresses them, how do you have a robust liability system um, that really gives people who are, ha have been harmed um, the ability to bring actions effectively and you know, efficiently. And one way to do that is to flush a lot of information their way and, in you know, um, to enable sort of their advocates uh, to, first of all, know when they've been harmed by an AI system, and second of all, to, you know, be able to work through the burdens of proof that they have. Um, and so some combination of ex ante regulatory requirements that are not too onerous so that they don't um, uh, impede competition, and ex post liability is probably the right combination. On the issue of whether there are differential concerns at different levels of the AI stack, um, we heard a lot about the difficulty of placing responsibility and regulatory re requirements on developers um, because they don't know necessarily how their system will be deployed and everything's moving so fast that they can't possibly um, uh, anticipate all of the possible risks. And so, um, you know, so when thinking about sort of the structure of regulation through um, the AI stack, it probably is right that you want to kind of push responsibility downstream as much as possible. Um, however, there are certain kinds of harms that only the developers are in a place in, in law. We talk about least cost avoider, that where they are clearly the least cost avoiders. And those really relate to training data um, and model architecture and things that they're responsible for and only they know, um, kind of, you know, especially in, in a proprietary system, um, how they work. And that's where kind of, um, you know, possibly ex ante regulation comes into play and setting standards, and also where information um, transmission becomes so important so that deployers understand what these systems are fit for, f to be used for, um, and they, you know, can make, if they are going to be the ones who are ultimately held responsible, they can make risk-based decisions. One of the things about AI regulation, AI best practices, AI risk management and evaluation is that um, they all turn on what are the standards, what are the benchmarks for performance, and all of that is kind of a work in process. Um, those standards, and you can very much see this in the, in the EU's AI Act, which is that standards are at the core of um, the risk management that the Act both envisions and incentivizes. And so then the question is, what are those standards and who sets them? And um, the EU AI Act itself, 
you know, through a complicated set of references to international treaties and to international standard setting, envisions that that standard setting process as being very inclusive, including of civil society and of SMEs. And so, you know, it it um, uh, very explicitly kind of calls for an open and inclusive standard setting process. Um, the the U.S. It has not done that yet, um, has not really incorporated a vision of standard setting into AI laws and regulation, in part because it hasn't adopted anything like the EU AI Act. We are beginning to see states doing this, but of course, you know, states are pretty far from international standard setting. And so it's a big question, and even in the EU AI Act, um, that all sounds good, right? Standard setting should be inclusive. You know, I think there are two kind of um, points I'd raise um, in this respect. One is that we heard a lot from civil society organizations that they find it very difficult to participate in standard setting. Um, mostly, it's a question of resources because where the rubber hits the road in these processes is in the technical committees that meet over a long period of time. And um, it, it is, you, you sort of have to be in the room um, in order to have an influence. And it's you know expensive and takes sustained commitment and they don't have the resources or personnel. So that's an area that needs support and attention. Um, and so in our support, uh, the, um, in our NTIA AI accountability report, where we have recommendations for regulation, guidance, and support, one of the support recommendations was to enable more participation in um, standard setting. I mentioned there were two kind of concerns. The second concern is that some of these standard setting bodies, you know, or the standards that need to be developed really are normative um, and kind of um, values-based standards. They're not only technical standards. Um, and so to some extent, they fall, some of those norms, for example, What's an acceptable amount of risk? What is um, a sustainability goal that should be met with respect to AI? What counts as discrimination or unlawful discrimination? You know, is very sort of country specific, and so um, so so those are decisions that really aren't in the sweet spot of of traditional technical standard setting, uh, and so how those norms get incorporated into standard setting, or to the extent that they can't be, um, how you can appropriately time the political process, which is really the place where those kinds of norms are established, and the standard setting process to which the political process refers, how you can time those two processes and have them relate um, you know, most productively together are, are questions that have to be answered for standards to really do the work that we're hoping they'll do. What you hear from Silicon Valley um, is too early, get, get, you know, let, let things develop. Um, and of course, that's a very valid perspective. But I think, um, you know, one of the, I, I forgot who it was in the, in, the, in the morning said, you know, I'm pro-innovation, I'm pro-Western I'm pro Western values, um, I'm pro-big AI and small AI and all of that. And um, just like leave us alone. Yeah. And I, I think the response to that is that was what the world heard in the 90s, and that is what regulators did. And now there's a sense that, you know, there, it's true, it's Goldilocks. I'm going to say this in mind. You don't want to go too early with regulation. You don't want to go too late. You don't want to go too strong. You don't want to go too weak. What's going on? Both parties are so anti tech. And the answer is, um, both parties were very pro-tech and listened to Silicon Valley through the 90s, and I think the sense is what they what we've got now are systemic harms um, that were not addressed. And so, you know, while of course it's very difficult to predict, and you can really screw things up when you regulate, you can also screw things up when you don't. We are already regulating AI, um, and some of the you know, federal law enforcement agencies, state law enforcement agencies, and, and you know agencies around the world are quick to point out that they already have jurisdiction over harms. That it doesn't matter whether they're caused by um, or, or you know whether AI has played a role uh, in the harm or not. Um, they so that goes for if you've got a medical device or a um, 
a medical decision or an employment decision or a, a an accident, right? Um, the law applies, and you know the complication may be proving causation or negligence. You may there, the the fact that certain technologies were relied on may complicate um, the enforcement of the law. But there is law. Um, so so really, I think when people are talking about is it too soon to regulate AI, they're often talking about kind of these ex ante regulations um, that would go to um, you know transparency requirements, explain ability requirements, um, bans, like the EU AI Act has banned, you know, certain kinds of algorithmic systems and certain kinds of contexts. And so I think that's really the question, is it too early for that? Um, and I think that probably the answer is yes and no. Um, you know, th there, there are a lot of good arguments that um, uh, regulators should be very careful because for example, large language models are um, really in their infancy, and it's not really clear yet how you would want to regulate them. And there is a danger that if you regulate them, you kind of lock in incumbent power. Um, so that's the argument against early regulation and for a kind of you know epistemic humility about what we know um, about these systems. On the other hand, you know, if you wait too long um, until you know everything, it can then already be too late because um, you know these systems are being woven in to um, our you know labor systems, our healthcare systems, our transportation systems, our educational systems, um, and so it becomes hard to unscramble the egg, and then you've got a kind of retrofit regulation to an embedded. Um, technology, embedded base of technology uh, that really can't respond easily to it, much less the political economy problems um, of uh, entrenched interests kind of not letting you regulate that way in a democratic system. Um, so, which is all, it's a sort of an unsatisfying way to say, um, you know, it's not really too early for some things. Um, it is too early for other things. The kind of regulations that I think are warranted now are kind of information forcing um, regulations. And so, for example, um, you know, I, uh, I mentioned earlier audits and evaluations um, uh, and kind of standardized disclosures, um, regulation of those things, even if it's in the form of guidance or even if it's in the form of um, uh, kind of federal procurement policies, um, it's really not too early for that. I mean, it can be always be, especially if you have um, procedures for amending any requirements quickly or sunsetting them. Um, uh, that kind of thing, you know, is it's we're we're ready for that. Um, you know, other kinds of more extensive and more kind of um, uh, high cost regulations or more normative um, uh, directives, it may it, we, we may want to wait.